Hello guys, hope you all are doing good for your exams. Preparations are going in full swing. In this video, I would be covering the income tax amendments as applicable for November 22 exams. So I would be doing it from the institute statutory update. The statutory update which has been released by our institute for November 22 exams guys. Clear? And one clarification before I start, please make sure that whatever video i have already made for me statutory update i have already covered it for me same things are again covered in this statutory update also which i will not be doing so please make sure that you guys before watching this video watch the statutory update video which has already been released for may 22 exams yeah because whatever statutory update for november 22 exams are there in this even those topics which were already there as per the statutory update which was released by the institute for may 22 are again repeated here so those things again i would not be covering it so if you guys have not watched that video please watch the may 22 statutory update first and then proceed with this video guys clear so with this clarification let me start with so this is the statutory update released by our institute for november 22 examination so for november 22 examination finance act 21 would be applicable like whatever we have already covered in our regular classes that means the finance financial year or previous year would be 21 22 and the assessment year would be 22 23 and whatever changes has been brought till 30th april 2022 will be applicable for you for november exams clear whatever changes amendments has happened up to 30th april 2022 will only be applicable for your november exams so in addition to whatever we already covered in our regular class plus whatever I already covered in my statutory update video for May 22, the things whatever is in addition amendments or any deletion additions are there, I would be covering it in this video. And also I have prepared a reference study material which will help the students to make changes in my material. So you can refer to my material also whenever I am going through any changes which has happened or amendments which has happened, I will also mention this changes with respect to what and what you are supposed to do. You can make little updations in your notes itself with respect to few topics for which this material will help you guys clear so while watching please make sure that you are having my notes ready with you fine chalo guys let's start so the first amendment is with respect to capital gains that is chapter 7 the fourth head of income with respect to fair market value this was already there in our may 22 rtp i have already covered in that video you guys can go through it then coming to this note part, this is very good news for the students. This note is with respect to ULIP, unit linked insurance policy. There was a new amendment or new provisions which was added in income tax act with respect to ULIP provisions. We have already covered this in our regular classes, but now the institute has given good news for the students telling any provisions with respect to ULIP is not applicable for CA exams, CA inter exams to be very clear. Yeah. So let me just go through it once. It may be noted that ULIP related provisions under section 214, 214 talks about the capital asset. So capital of asset definition includes the ULIP also. Section 451B which is a charging section for capital gains head and section 112A which talks about the tax rate in case of some special assets. Definition of equity oriented fund discussed in unit 4, chapter 4, capital gains and ULIP related provisions under section 1010D which talks about exemptions discussed along with the deduction under section 80C in chapter 7 deduction from gross total income in June 2021 additions of the study material. So the institute had included this in the syllabus as per their study material also accordingly even I have covered it in my regular classes but now are not applicable are not applicable for intermediate examination. Hence, students are advised to ignore the ULIP related provisions discussed in the above section in the study material. So what do we do sir? Here, simple. Anyway, there is just a reduction in the syllabus with respect to ULIP policy. So now come to capital gains chapter or head that is unit 4. There we have capital asset definition na, and given under section 214. So there the C point was with respect to ULIP. So capital asset includes ULIP also was there. This is actually actual definition of 214, but now the institute is telling that this is not applicable for our exams. So whatever I have highlighted in red color means it is not applicable. So, so accordingly, you guys also 
can scratch this in your material. Actually, capital asset definition includes ULIP. The, uh, from the definition itself, they have not removed it. Our institute had just told that this ULIP part is not applicable for CA inter examination. Yeah, it's not like okay, they have removed this ULIP only from 214. 214 even still now includes ULIP. Yeah, this is just a clarity. Then coming to year of chargeability. So coming to section 45, there the B point which talks about ULIP just scrap that also. So you need not study this for your exams. November 22 exams are going forward. Any exams? Yes. So this is all about the ULIP in capital gains head. Then also come to deduction chapter that is chapter 8. There the first section ATC talks about various type of investment. There the first point A is there now. That also you have to remove it which is with respect to ULIP. Okay. Hope you guys are doing it. Then come to notes in that first note A point A is with respect to ULIP point. So that is additional conditions in case of ULIP. So even this is not there. So in simple any provision related to ULIP is removed from CA inter syllabus guys. Hope you guys are clear with this. So accordingly please do study for your exams. So your burden to some extent has been reduced by the institute. Chalo, let us go to the next part. Chapter 9, Advanced Tax, TDS and Introduction to TCS. So even this topic was already covered in our May 22 statutory update. So I have also covered it already. So anything new, some few things are new here, which I will cover. All these things are already covered guys. So which I have already covered, I am not doing it as I already told you. Yeah, this part. So come to this part, which is new now. <clears throat> Guidelines under section 194 OQ and C1H circular number. So this part, not this, this one. Adjustment of various state levies and taxes other than GST. Now coming to 194Q, what is section 194Q guys? So if there is any buyer who has purchased the goods worth more than 50 lakh in a year, more than 50 lakh in a year, then he has to deduct TDS at 0.1% on the amount exceeding 50 lakh on the amount exceeding 50 lakh and while deducting the TDS are we supposed to deduct TDS even on GST part? No. The answer was no. That is whatever amount of TDS will be deducted it is on the amount excluding GST. Agree that clarification was already given in our May 22 RTP. But now coming to sir what if there is any other tax for example for some few products selected products GST is not applicable. Our old laws are applicable. In that case, should we deduct the tax including that amount is the question. So what is that we will see. Adjustment of various state levies and taxes other than GST. So other than GST is applicable. See GST is applicable for any goods or services irrespective of the type of goods or service. But now the GST has been excluded on few products like alcoholic liquor for human consumption or petroleum products like that. So on that whatever was the tax which was levied before GST will be levied. So in that case, what we have to do is given here. Treatment of tax deduction on GST component included in the invoice has been clarified by CBDT circular number 13, 2021 dated 30th June 2021, which we already seen our, in our previous video. This circular gives clarification in case of purchase of goods which are not covered within the purview of GST. So there might be some goods which are not covered under GST for which the whole taxation might be applicable like sales tax, VAT, like the, those things, but which are subject to VAT, sales tax, excise duty, CST, CST means central sales tax. So in that case, what do we do? Condition, where tax is deducted at the time of credit of the amount in the account of the seller. So if the um, TDS is T, as per section 194Q, when TDS has to be deducted means at the time of payment or at the time of credit, whichever is earlier, who will deduct it? buyer when he is paying to the seller how much he will deduct 0.1 percent on the amount in excess of 50 lakh in excess of 50 lakh and also there is a condition for the buyer telling buyer means the person whose turnover or gross receipt is more than 10 crore in the last year only then he is covered under section 194 q in the current year yeah so all these things we have already discussed in detail with respect to 194 q whatever they are given here is just a clarifications whether is it applicable on what amount? Is it including uh, tax or excluding tax? Tax in the sense indirect tax here. Clear? Yeah? Yes. Chalo. 
where tax is deducted at the time of credit of the amount in the amount in the amount in the account of the seller and in terms of the agreement or contract between the buyer and seller component of vat sales tax excise duty cst cst not gst is indicated separately in the invoice so if the tds is deducted at the time of crediting the amount to the account of the seller and the amount is separately mentioned in the invoice in that case tax has to be deducted only on the amount credited without without including such vat sales tax excise duty cst etc for example assume there is a sale of alcoholic liquor for human consumption for 70 lakh okay plus plus vat is levied at 10 lakh i'm just taking random number so the amount is separately mentioned in the invoice so totally buyer is paying how much 80 lakh to the seller now on what amount he has to deduct tds so is it on 10 lakh or 70 lakh or only 20 lakh it is only on 20 lakh it is only on 20 lakh that is 50 lakh minus sorry 70 lakh minus 50 lakh which is the limit which you get 20 lakh into 0.1 percent in simple the tds should not be deducted on the tax component very similar thing was already discussed with respect to gst but now more clarification is given with respect to goods on which gst is not applicable but previous indirect taxation regime is applicable in that case also same story clear yes next sir where tax is deducted on payment basis so i am making payment first so in that case because tds under section 194q will be deducted at the time of payment or at the time of credit whichever is earlier so we are paying we are making some advance payment so on that tds is deducted in that case what we have to do on what amount tds has to be deducted tax has to be deducted on the whole amount including the tax amount including tax in the sense including vat cst whatever tax amount and here when i am mentioning tax for this point means it is indirect tax price yeah yes so tax has to be deducted and here tax means tds yeah has to be deducted on the whole amount so whole amount here includes including tax part since it is not possible to identify the payment with the tax component to be involved invoiced in the future so now for example assume the buyer is making an advance payment of 80 lakh to the seller the buyer is making an advance payment of 80 lakhs to the seller so on what amount he has to deduct tds and here there will not be a breakup because this is an advance payment so in that case straight away deduct 50 lakh on this so on 30 lakh 0.1 percent will be deducted as there is no breakup in 80 lakh how much is related to tax on the entire amount that is 80 minus 50 50 is the limit which is equal to 30 lakh on that 0.1 percent will be deducted yeah yes next in case of purchase returns where the money is refunded by the seller so there was a purchase later there is a return of it in that case tax is already deducted at the time of purchase itself the tax is deducted on whatever amount it was supposed to be deducted now a certain part of the goods which was purchased is returned back so in that case will tds be given back no you can adjust it in the future transactions tax deducted earlier under section 194q on such purchase which is now returned may be adjusted against the next purchase from the same seller so you can adjust it in the future transaction with the same party next in case of purchase returns where goods are replaced by the seller so there is a returns it returns means the buyer was not happy with few goods so he has returned it so in place of it new goods has been given for him so that means there is an exchange of goods agree so in that case is there any adjustment which is required to be done no no adjustment is required to be done even in the future yeah because there is a one return and immediately one sale has happened so no question of adjustments in that case hope it is clear for you guys yeah next applicability of section 194q in cases where exemption has been provided under section 206c 1a so see 194q talks about tds whereas 206c 1a talks about what tcs so what is it let me just go through that provision first yeah i have mentioned it come to this see you know who should collect tcs when it comes to tcs it is not deduction it is collection who will collect it seller seller will collect it from the buyer 
and in which all cases the TCS will be collected. I have just mentioned here, okay, which is also given in my regular study material. So there are various cases in which all cases the seller will collect the TCS is given here. Okay, so there are some amendments with respect to this. That is why I have taken. Now, what is this non-applicability of TCS? So as per section 206C1A and one more thing, sir, when TDS is applicable on a transaction, on the same transaction, TCS will not be applicable. I repeat once again, when TDS is applicable on any particular transaction, will TCS also will be applicable on the same transaction? No, will not be applicable. That clarification cross application we have already discussed in our May 22 statutory update video guys. Clear, especially that is when it comes to 194Q, those transactions can also be covered in TCS part as per section 206C1H. So from 194Q point of view, we will check from the buyer. So buyer is he deducting the TDS? If not, we will come back and see 206C1H, is it applicable? And the applicability of section 206C1H depends on the seller. That is seller is collecting the money from the buyer where the sale value is more than 50 lakh in a year and the seller is having a gross receipts of more than 10 crore in the last year. In that case, the seller will collect the TCS from the buyer. In addition to his sale value, he will also collect TCS at 0.1% in excess of the amount whatever is there of 50 lakh. Yeah, yes sir. So will both things will be applicable on the same transaction, sir, buyer will deduct TDS T, uh, and seller will collect TCS. No, that will not happen. On a particular purchase of goods, if already 194Q is applicable if for the same transaction for the seller, again 206C1H is not applicable. So this cross application clarification is already discussed. Yes. Now coming to 206 one a the clarification given now is with respect to this. Now 206C1A what it tells, there is no change in this. This is already given in my regular material. I am just going through that so that you guys get more clarity. No collection of tax shall be made in case of resident buyer. Okay. So no need to uh, collect TCS if the buyer is a resident. If such buyer furnishes to the person responsible for collecting tax a declaration in writing in duplicate in the prescribed form and verified in the prescribed manner to the effect that goods referred to in to section 206C1 EVO are to be utilized for the purpose of manufacturing, processing, producing articles or things or for the purpose of generation of power and not for trading purpose. So what are they trying to tell? See under section 206 subsection 1, there are various goods covered. So whenever the seller is selling this products, he has to collect what the TCS from the buyer at whatever rate it is given here. Okay, sir. But if the buyer is a resident and whatever products he is purchasing here, he is not trading in it. He is using this as a raw material to manufacture something else. To manufacture something else. So he is using all any of this products, whatever he has bought as a raw material to manufacture his output or is engaged in generation of electricity or power. In that case, TCS is not applicable. TCS is not applicable. That is seller is not required to collect TCS. So the clarification given here is just a second. The clarification given here is sir, section 194Q does not apply in respect of transaction where tax is collectible under section 206C. Okay. That means when TCS is collectible, 194Q will not be applicable. Okay. But so except sale of goods under section 206C1H. So when it comes to 206C1H, first we will check 194Q. If that is not applicable, only then we will go to 206C1H. Agree? Yes, sir. So what clarification they are giving is 194Q will not be applicable wherever TCS is collectible. Under any section of 206C, if TCS is collected by the seller, in that case, TDS is not applicable for the buyer under section 194Q. Okay. Now, section 206C1H requires to collect tax at source in respect of sale of goods other than the goods which have been covered under section 206C1, 1F and 1G. So that is what I explained you. That is from seller point of view, we will see. If there is a sale of goods more than 50 lakh, any goods more than 50 lakhs in a year and if the seller's gross turnover or receipt in the last year was more than 10 crore, 
then seller has to collect that is what is given in section 206 c1 h that is the seller has to collect tcs at 0.1 percent on the amount exceeding 50 lakh on the amount exceeding 50 lakh yeah now in accordance with section 206 c1a tax is not required to be collected in case of a resident buyer who furnishes declaration to the effect that the goods under section 206c1 are to be utilized for the purpose of manufacturing processing or producing articles or things or for the purpose of generation of power and not for trading purpose this is what i read from my material agree na this is what i read here same to same thing this is what the provisions covered in section 200c1a and there is no change in this yes sir so that means if the sorry if the buyer is a resident and if he is buying the goods which is mentioned under section 206 206c1 which the buyer is using in the manufacturing or processing of his output or for the generation of electricity then no need to collect tcs now in case of goods which are covered under section 206c1 but exempted under section 206c1a tax would not be collected under section tax would not be collected under what section 206 1 there are 1h so tcs will not be applicable in both the cases in both the cases now the question is sir will tds be applicable yes it can be applicable that is what the last line here it is clarified that the provision of section 194q will apply in such cases covered under section 206 1a and the buyer is not liable to deduct is liable to deduct uh, tax that is tedious under section 194q if the conditions specified therein are fulfilled sir what is this too many things are they are given let me simplify guys listen listen yeah look yeah so section 206 subsection 1 will tell what let me just show it sir if seller is selling uh, this kind of goods there are some specified goods here then on whatever sale consideration is charging to the buyer he has to collect tcs at what rate it is mentioned here okay same way coming to 206 1h yeah which is given here so if seller is selling the goods worth more than any goods here they, they have not mentioned what type of goods whereas in subsection 1 they have clearly told what type of goods are covered so if seller is selling any goods to the resident buyer and the value of that sale is more than 50 lakh in that case if the seller's turnover or gross receipts in the last year was more than 10 crore then he has to collect TCS at 0.1% on the amount exceeding 50 lakh. Yes, sir. But in both these cases, in both these cases, what happens? If the buyer is a resident and if he has purchased the goods for the purpose of manufacturing, processing his output or generation of power, then TCS will not be collected. Seller will not collect TCS. That is what the clarity is given. Yes. And where is it mentioned? in section 206 c1a and now what clarity they are giving giving is sir in this case can tds be deducted under section 194q yes it can be deducted provided whatever conditions are given in section 194q is satisfied by the buyer so you know what is the conditions given in case of uh, 194q that is the sale buy value or sale value should be more than 50 lakh plus the buyer's turnover in the last year should be more than 10 crore only then 194q is applicable so if those conditions are satisfied then the buyer can deduct tds under section 194q so when tcs is not applicable can tds be applicable was the question here yes the answer is yes yeah so where exemption has been given so as per section 206c1a exemption is been given for the buyer okay when he is purchasing the goods for the purpose of manufacturing processing or generation of electricity in that case seller will not collect tcs but can buyer deduct tds in the same scenario under section 194q yes provided whatever conditions are given there is satisfied clear guys hope it is clear for you next some more clarity with respect to 194q only what is it applicability of the provisions of section 194q in case of department of government not being a public sector undertaking or corporation so what is it to be considered as a buyer for the purpose of section 194q such person should be carrying out a business or commercial activity agree na? means the turnover from the business or commercial activity or profession should be more than 10 crore in the last year yes 
and the total sales gross receipts or turnover from such business or commercial activity should be more than 10 crore when during the financial year immediately preceding the financial year in which goods are being purchased by such person so what are the issues which are addressed here can department of government be a buyer for the purpose of section 194q can the department of government that is central government be a buyer can they deduct tds the question is that so if it is carrying on the business or commercial activity check what was their turnover in the last year if it was more than 10 crore yes they have to deduct tds who will deduct here buyer and who is the buyer department of government okay sir next sir if it is not carrying on any business activity so if the department of government is not carrying any business activity so obviously they will not be having any turnover from their business or commercial activity in the last year so in that case they are not the specified buyer as per section 194q so will they deduct tds no because the buyer is not at all covered in the section 194q so last one can department of central government or state government be considered as seller for the purpose of section 194q so can department of government that is central or state government be covered as seller can buyer deduct the tds when the seller is the department of central government or state government the answer is no clear cut clarity is given that is if the payee payee for any section for any section of tds if the payee is the department of central government or state government or simply central government state government then no need to deduct tds because it is their own money why to deduct again and give it to them only that is why so here again what is the clarity given that is sir if the government is a buyer then they can deduct tds but if the government or government department is a seller will the buyer deduct the tds no irrespective of who is the buyer who is that what is the turnover for him no need to deduct tds by him he will not deduct tds okay next note a public and sector undertaking or corporation established under central or state act or any other such body authority or entity would however be required to comply with the provisions of section 194q and tax shall be deducted accordingly means if there is no specific exemption given for like public sector undertaking or corporation and all especially when they are buyer they have to deduct the tds clear yes Chal. next non applicability of provisions of section 206 1g to a non resident individual visiting india now what is this first we will just go through this what is the provision of section 206c 1g and then i will explain this come to this 1g subsection 1g yeah so what is this let me just go through tcs on remittance outside india or sale of overseas tour package authorized dealer receiving from a buyer so authorized dealer means the person who is engaged in exchange exchange of foreign currencies with indian currencies like that receiving from a buyer for remittance out of india and seller of overseas tour pa tour program package the best example is thomas cook from a buyer shall collect from a buyer so the seller or the authorized dealer will collect from the buyer what tcs at what rate tcs at five percent for an amount exceeding seven lakh in a financial year and is for the purpose other than purchase of overseas tour program package so if the amount is more than seven lakh in excess of 7 lakh whatever is there on that 5 percent tds sorry tcs will be collected okay next when it comes to tour package the tour operator shall collect tcs on the entire sum as there is no threshold limit for him for example assume thomas cook is providing some foreign tour or overseas tour package for which they are charging 10 lakh rupees 10 lakh rupees so entire on 10 lakh 5 percent tcs will be collected whereas assume there is an authorized dealer with whom I am exchanging 10 lakh worth of currency. In that case, on what amount he will collect TCS? 10 lakh minus 7 lakh. That is whatever in excess of 7 lakh is there, 3 lakh into 5%. Hope it is clear for you. So this is with respect to tour package. This is with respect to exchange of currency. Yeah. TCS at 0.5% if the amount exceeding 7 lakh being remitted out is a loan obtained from any financial institution as defined in section 80e 80e talks about education loan that is deduction for interest on education loan to be very clear for the purpose of pursuing any education 
so if any person has taken loan and he wanted to convert that into foreign currency for obtaining the education outside india in any university or college in that case tcs will be collected only on zero only at 0.5 percent on the amount exceeding 7 lakh okay and if there is no pan furnished then tcs would be 10 percent okay sir then there was one exemption given here what is it we will see provision of this subsection shall not apply if the buyer is liable to deduct tds that is tax at source under any other provisions of this act and has deducted such amount so if buyer has covered at the same transaction already assume under section 194c or 194j and the buyer has already deducted at tds in that case will seller again collect the tcs on the same transaction no clear yes sir so this was the provisions with respect to section 206c 1g and there is no change in that whatever exemption was given here na, now they have added some more they have given some more exemption what is it we will see yeah tax is collectible under section 206c 1g by an authorized dealer who receives an amount under liberalized remittance scheme lrs means liberalized remittance scheme of rba for overseas remittance from a buyer being a person remitting such amount out of india and a seller of an overseas tour package who receives any amount from a buyer who purchases the package however this is what the change guys this is the amendment part however tcs under section 206c1g would not be applicable if the buyer is an individual so if the buyer is an individual who is not a resident in India as per section 6.1 or 6.1a. 6.1a talks about deemed resident. So, the buyer is an individual who is not a resident. In simple, we can call him as non-resident and who is visiting India. He is just visiting India. So, in that case, TCS will not be applicable. TCS, the authorized dealer will not collect TCS from the buyer who is an individual non-resident who are visiting India. Yeah, guys this is the amendment part or they have newly added this exemption part Chalo. next coming to the amendments with respect to chapter 10 that is provision for filing return of income and self-assessment so this is with respect to return of income so this part we have already covered in my previous video for may 22 exams yeah now this part is important this one now again this is a new amendment for november 22 exams what is it we will see this is an important guys yeah before this i will just go through my regular material what is given come to the assessment procedure chapter guys that is chapter 11 there i have given compulsory filing of return of income who all should file the return of income compulsory so section 139 subsection 1 tells who all should file their return of income mandatorily and what is the due date also is given under section 139 one only so who all are those person who are supposed to file the return of income we have already covered in detail in our regular class now for this list they have added some more they have added some more people based on the transaction limit they have added some more people that is what we are going through now yes so you guys can connect that is why i'm just also mentioning where these things are covered in my regular study material so that you guys can connect and study yes so requirement of filing return of income under section 139 subsection 1 by certain persons when the quantum of prescribed transaction exceed the prescribed monetary threshold notification number 37 bar 2022 dated 21st april 2022 so what are those Clause 4 to 7th proviso of section 139 subsection 1 provides that a person other than a company or a firm who is not required to furnish a return under section 139 subsection 1 has to furnish return on or before the due date if the person fulfills such conditions as may be prescribed. So what are they trying to tell here? See if the person is already covered here under section 139 1 it's fine they will file the return they are supposed to file the return mandatorily. So, if there is any other person who is not covered in any of these points, they are not covered in any of these points. For them, they have also told, if you are crossing so and so transaction limit, then even you have to file the return. And there they have excluded company and firm. Why? Because for company and firm, it is mandatory to file their return of income. Irrespective of whether they are having income or loss, they have to file the return. 
<laughs> so that means what is mentioned in that paragraph is any person other than company or partnership firm who is not covered in point two, three, four, five. Who is not covered in point two, three, four, five. If they are covered in the points which are mentioned here, they are supposed to file the return. So which are those cases we will see here. So they have to file the returns. What are those? Is given in rule 12AB. So rule 12AB is a new rule has been inserted wide this notification to prescribe the following other condition for furnishing return under section 139 1 accordingly so this paragraph is not required so you may get confused i will read and explain one by one so now any person who is not covered under section 139 1 if that person is carrying on any business okay is not a company because if it is a company or partnership firm mandatory they have to file because there can be an individual who is carrying on the business so in that case if his total sales turnover or gross receipts as the case may be in the business is more than 60 lakh during the relevant previous year for example assume i am an individual whose turnover in my business is more than 60 lakh in previous year 21 22 should i file my return yes irrespective of how much income you have what electricity bill you have paid how much travel expenditure you have incurred that doesn't matter see if you are already covered in one section 139 1 it's okay if you are not covered, then we will check all this. Yeah, yes. So if the turnover from the business is more than 60 lakh during the relevant previous year, means my previous year 21-22, then they have to file their return of income mandatorily. Okay. Now what about the person who is carrying on the profession? Now assume I am carrying on the profession of practicing chartered accountant. I am a practicing chartered accountant. So from my profession, if the gross receipt is more than 10 lakh during the relevant previous year, then it is mandatory for me to file my returns irrespective of my income they are not talking about income here gross receipts gross receipts even for a business they spoke about sales turnover gross receipts not income or profit yes then coming to the third one so first two cases was with respect to business profession third one a resident individual who is aged more than or equal to 60 years that means senior citizen guys senior citizen at any time during the relevant previous year, the aggregate of TDS and TCS in this case is more than or equal to 50,000 during the relevant previous year. Now assume there is a resident senior citizen who has reached 60 years at any time during the previous year. At any time during the previous year, if he has reached the age of 60 years, we call him as resident senior citizen. Okay. And what will be the basic exemption limit applicable for him? 3 lakh. Okay, sir. Now, on his income or amount, if TDS deducted is 30,000, uh, sorry, 50,000 or more during the year, TDS as well as TCS, both put together. Now assume there is Mr. A who is aged 62 years. Okay, I'm just taking the example. On whose income in 21-22, TDS is deducted 30,000 and TCS collected is 25,000. TCS collected is how much? 25,000. How much is the total? 55. So, should he file the returns mandatorily? Yes, he has to file the return of income. Irrespective of how much income he has, he has to file the returns. This is the criteria. Clear? Now, sir, what if TDS itself is 80,000? Then also he has to file it. Yeah. So, TDS plus TCS, if it is more than 50,000, TDS alone or TCS alone is more than 50,000 also, he has to file his returns mandatorily. Yeah. And, sir, for others, other than resident senior citizen, the amount limit instead of 50,000 is 25,000, which is half. So in case of any other person like you and me, if the TDS and TCS, the additions of both, the aggregate of both deducted or collected is more than or equal to 25,000 during the relevant previous year, a person is supposed to file his returns mandatorily. Yeah, yes. The last one. The person having a savings bank account, he can be having any number of saving bank, bank account. I might be having one, two, three, but the deposit in one or more savings bank account of the person in aggregate is more than or equal to 50 lakh during the previous year. Now assume I have two savings bank account, one with SBI, another with HDFC bank. Okay. Now I have deposited 30 lakh into my savings account in SBI and I have deposited 22 lakh into my savings account of HDFC bank. In that case, what is the total amount? Both put together, 52 lakh. Should I file my return? Yes, I have to file my returns. So this four uh, 
transactions are totally actually five, including A and B here. So this five total cases have been newly added through what? Through rule 12 AB. So whatever was already there under section 139 subsection one remains same. There is no change in it. In addition to that, they have added five more cases as per the rule. Clear guys? Yes. So that means there is no change with respect to whatever we already covered in our regular material. You need not make any changes there. Next. Fee for subsequent intimation of other. So now other has made, made, made very important. So assessees are asked to intimate their other or link other with PAN for the purpose of income tax so that the department can track the transaction, income, all the information about the assessee. Now what if the assessee fails? The due date to file or the due date to link other with the PAN was 31st March 2022 which was previously a different due date, maximum they extended it to 31st March 2022. Now, sir, if it is not linked even before 31st March 2022, what is the consequences? That is what is given here. Let us go through. Under section 234H, where a person who is required to intimate his Aadhaar number, under section 139AA subsection 2, 139AA subsection 2 talks about what? Aadhaar intimation fails to do so on or before the notified date. So the maximum due date which was given was previously, uh, it was earlier dates, but they kept on extending it. So the last due date was 31st March 2022. Okay. You would be liable to pay such fee as may be prescribed at the time of making intimation under section 139 AA to after 31st March 2022. However, such fee shall not exceed 1000. That means, sir, what if the person is linking his Aadhaar after 31st March 2022? In that case, he can link it, but along with the fee, late fee of how much? Maximum 1000 rupees. Maximum, so he can still link it after 31st March 2022, but with the late fee, maximum 1000 rupees. Okay. So as per section 139AA, subsection 2, every person who has been allotted PAN as on 1st July 2017, and eligible to obtain Aadhaar number is required to intimate his Aadhaar number to the prescribed authority in the prescribed form and manner. Okay, means PAN, whoever has been allotted PAN is supposed to also intimate his Aadhaar. So intimate Aadhaar means they are supposed to link it. On the income tax website, they are supposed to link what? The Aadhaar with the PAN. Accordingly, the CBDT wide notification number 17 bar 2022, dated 29th March 2022, inserted rule 114.5a to provide that if such person fails to do so by the date notified in section 139a8 subsection 2 that is 31st March 2022 this is the maximum due date to link the other or to intimate other then at the time of subsequent intimation of this other number to the prescribed authority such person would be liable to pay by way of fee an amount equal to so what is the amount of equal to the fee what is the amount of late fee he will pay 500 rupees in case where such intimation is made within three months from the date referred in section 139 AA 2 by 30th June 2022 and 1000 rupees in all other cases. Now, what was the maximum due date to link your other guys? 31st March 22. So if it is linked on or before 31st March 22, there is no penalty or sorry, there is no late fee. Okay. Sir, what if it is done within three months? So assume. 30th June, not 31st, 30th June. So if it is done within this time, it's okay. Still, you can do it within three months. There will be a late fee of 500 rupees. There will be a late fee of 500 rupees. Sir, after this, if I am doing after 30th June 22, if I am linking my other or if I am intimating my other, then what is the late fee? It will be 1000 rupees. It will be 1000 rupees. Yeah, please be careful because you can expect a question on this in November exam. Clarification with respect to relaxation of provisions of rule 114 AAA prescribing the manner of making PAN inoperative read with notification number 17 bar 2022 dated 23rd March 2022. So here whatever provisions we just now went through is with respect to what? PAN part. Oh, yeah, yeah. Just a second. PAN part. Sorry, other part. Now we are going through PAN. Now what they told us the income tax department if they if the assessee don't link his pan, uh, other with the pan before 31st march 2022 then his pan will become inoperative 
its pan will become inoperative so they have given some clarification with respect to that what is it we will see pay attention guys section 139 aa double a subsection 2 makes it mandatory for every person who has been allotted a pan as on 31st july sorry 1st july 2017 to intimate his aadhar number so that aadhar and pan can be linked this is required to be done on or before the notified date and what was that notified date 31st March 22 failing which the pan would become inoperative they are told if you don't do that if you fail to link your other with your pan within 31st March 2022 then your pan will become inoperative from 1st April that is what the provisions was okay but accordingly in case of failure to intimate the other number by 31st March 2022 the pan allotted to a person would be made inoperative Further, section 234H provides that where a person who is required to intimate his other under section 139AA subsection 2 fails to do so on or before a notified date that is 31st March 22, he would be liable to pay a fee not exceeding 1000 as the case may be prescribed at the time of making intimation under section 139AA after the said date. So here what are they trying to tell? Ah, you can still even after 31st March also, you can still do link your other with PAN, but with a late fee. So here they are giving the option, okay, you are supposed to do it before 31st March. Okay, if you don't do it, you can still do it, but with the late fee. With the late fee as per section 234H, that is what they have given here. Okay. Further, rule 114 AAA provides that if pan of a person has become inoperative, so if a pan of a person becomes inoperative due to non-intimating the other, then what all will happen? He will not be able to furnish intimate or coat his pan and would be liable to all the consequences under the act for such failure. This will have a number of implications such as, so, so if a person fails to intimate his other before 31st March 22, then from 1st April is pan will become inoperative and if his pan becomes inoperative then what are the consequences he will fail he will face one by one the person would not be able to file his return using inoperative pan so if you are having inoperative pan with with that you cannot file your return yes then pending returns will not be processed then pending refers cannot be issued into inoperative pans then pending proceedings as in the case of defective returns cannot be completed once the pan is inoperative last one tax will be tax will be required to be deducted at a higher rate as pan becomes inoperative so if the pan is not given then the rate of tds as well as TD tcs is higher so when the person's pan is becomes inoperative it is equivalent to invalid pan agree so in that case the tds and tcs will be deducted and collected at higher rate so, in addition to above, the taxpayer might face difficulty at various other foro like banks and other financial portals as PAN is one of the important KYC, that is know your client, criterion for all kinds of financial transactions. As per rule 114 AAA dub, subsection 2, or sorry, sub rule 2, where a person whose PAN has become inoperative under rule 114 AAA sub rule 1 is required to furnish intimate or quote his PAN, it would be deemed that he has not furnished, intimated or quoted the PAN as the case may be in accordance with the provisions of the Act. Consequently, he would be liable for all the consequences under the Act for not furnishing, intimating or quoting the PAN. Okay. So, with respect to this, a relaxation has been given. What is it? In order to have a smooth application of Section 234H and existing Rule 114 AAA, it is clarified that impact of, from here it is important guys, it is clarified that the impact of rule 114 AAA 2 would come into effect from 1st April 23 and the period from 1st April 22 to 31st March 23 would be period during which rule 114 AAA 2 would not have its negative consequences, will not have its negative consequences. However, the taxpayer would be liable to pay fee in accordance with section 214. 234H read with rule 114.5A. Sir, what is this? Too many things they have given. Very simple, guys. Let me just simplify it. Now, the notified date to intimate other was what? As per section 139AA 
it was 31st March 22. If you don't intimate it within this date, they are told that your PAN will become inoperative. But is this the situation now? No. What they are told is, if you still intimate it within next 3 months, you can intimate it with a fine of 500 rupees. So even after that also you can intimate it but with a late fee of 1000 rupees. So this late fee is given under section 234H. Okay sir. Now what they are telling is, now still they are giving maximum time still when? 1st April 23. So you can still intimate your other till 1st April 23. So within that time if you don't do, then only your pan will become inoperative. So that means from 31st March to 1st April 23, you can still intimate your other with late fee as per section 234H, but your PAN will not become inoperative. PAN will not become inoperative. So that means you can still file your returns, claim, refund, it can be processed, everything will happen. But you have to file, intimate it at least maximum within 1st April 23. Okay, so they have given some relaxation here. So make sure that whether you, your clients or your parents, whoever, if by chance, if no, none, if any of them has not intimated their PAN till now, please make sure that you link it with your PAN on income tax portal within 1st April 23. Clear guys? Yes, sir. Yeah. The last point here. Note the last date for intimating other number under the income tax act 1961 for the purpose of linking other with pan has been extended from 30th june to 21 2021 to 31st march previously the due date to link the other was 30th june 2021 they extended it to 31st march 2022 okay so till 31st march 2022 you would have linked your other without any late fee after that also you can still do it but with late fee but with late fee as per section 234H, that is either 500 rupees or 1000 rupees. Clear. Even now that June thing also is done, that is 30th June 2022 is also over. So you can only link your other after paying 1000 rupees. Clear. But question in the exam can be asked for any period. They can put a question even before 31st, 30th June also. So please be careful. The dates are also important here guys. Clear? Yes. So this is all about the amendments with respect to income tax which are applicable for November 22 exams. Hope everything was clear for you guys. All the best. Prepare well. Pass with very good marks guys. All the best. Bye bye.